Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is Margaret Kanesh, uh, Chair of Wate Power. Welcome back, Margaret. Thank you. So you were just talking about a number of things, but, but you've got 22 First Nations that are all coming together, which sounds incredible to get that many communities all agreeing on anything. That's right. So what is some of your secret of, uh, of your success to be able to, to get everybody on board? I think uh, uh, one of the ways is, uh, uh, first of all, what it, why are we doing this? And I think getting that mandate from our leadership and the support that's required uh, by the communities um, is uh, key to success of this project. I think the other thing is the communities coming together to work together on a, a huge initiative and then partnering with um, um, industry uh, we have a transmission partner, Res Fortis, that works with us on this. And uh, we had to go through like a, a process of how we do that. And uh, also engaging Ontario and federal governments in terms of how they can be part of this major initiative. And um, the driving force are the First Nations. And uh, we focus on the mandate and the needs of the people and we move the project forward that way. So. Going back, reporting on the status of the project, ensuring that uh, the capacity building, the community readiness, the local distribution, all those various elements that we need to work on has input and feedback uh, from our communities is crucial to the success of this project. Because without their support, we are not going to have a project. So. What do you see as some of the benefits? So we're talking about bringing in the infrastructure with, with, uh, for electricity, replacing the diesel generators. Right. Would it be replacing them or is this additional too? Uh, the business case that we've done initially is to look at uh, how are we going to replace the diesel generators to bring in the transmission grid. Yes, the cost is $1.35 billion. Um, however, if you t take a look at the status quo of diesel genera gen generator costs currently invested by both levels of government and the rate payers, um, if you take a long-term uh, look at this project um, and the cost of it, there will be a, a savings of a billion dollars over a number of years. So that's the that's the that's where it's at from a financial perspective. So, so you can both save money and reduce the uh, the pollution from the diesel generators. Right. You're also bringing uh, uh, opening up opportunities for our communities to expand their business and economic opportunities, and also um, address some of the um, the the conditions that are that are in the community and improve the living conditions of our people. So there's a, I think if you take a look at this project, I mean, a lot of people are concerned about the cost, but I always tell people it's a reinvestment of what you're currently investing into dirty diesel and bringing in clean energy and reliable power to our communities and also providing opportunities and building that capacity at the community level by having that ownership concept and how are we going to move forward in those various initiatives that our people want to do. So... Oftentimes in big infrastructure, they talk about the benefit is, is the jobs. Right. Which, what I heard you say earlier, you're trying to ensure that folks from your communities are involved in that. But then there's this additional benefit, which is the possibility for more economic development as well as security in, in the communities. Yes. And I think uh, not only that, the improvement of the the health and safety and living daily living conditions of our people. I mean, housing is a major uh, issue in our communities. Uh, currently, we have a backlog of uh, need for homes in the community. Uh, without proper power in the community, we cannot build new homes and we cannot connect new homes. So um, that's a direct impact on the, a daily living of an individual or a young family that needs a home. So that's a, one of the examples. and. Also, if there's, uh, depending on the number of uh, outages, um, 
uh, in terms of in, in expanding on uh, infrastructure such as sewer and water, those at times can be compromised depending on what time, what kind of power outages we have, how long the power outages um, will impact the current infrastructure that's in place. So we need to start addressing those issues. We already have water quality issues, as you may be well aware, with the the various reports that have been provided out there. And uh, the so the water advisories yes. in so many communities. So I mean, there there's a, a number of factors related to that, and uh, so. Um, I mean, we're taking a look at this um, from a big picture and also at, uh, from a cost perspective. And so it sounds like a mammoth project. And here you are, you're chairing this, this big project. What, what gets you going in the mornings? And, and how do you keep your energy up to, to, to keep this project moving? I look at the communities I work for. I look at the needs that they've um, come to me to try and work with them on to improve the living situation of that those individuals in the communities who desperately need this and uh, particularly when you take a look at the families the children the elders that's my driving force and I believe I also believe that our people must uh, take on their destiny and that is to become a nation of who we say we are a sovereign nation and part of that is to take ownership in, uh, in the major infrastructure and development that happens in our homeland and create that opportunity and benefits for our people. It, it just sounds like such an exciting project. What's your time frame? When do you uh, expect the, the project to be complete? If there is a completion, I'm not sure. Well, there is a timeline and a schedule that uh, we're working on and um, the phase one, we hope to start uh, building 2018 uh, with phase two with a completion date of 2023. So, I mean, this is not like this is going to happen tomorrow. There's a lot of critical paths that we still have to work towards to um, in enabling this project to become a reality, such as some of the regulatory and legal requirements. And uh, there's processes that Ontario Energy has, Ontario Energy Board has, which is very complex. A lot of people, even the mainstream society, I find, don't understand their own energy process. Mm -hmm. So so as we learn about this, we educate our people about it. We also educate the government's industry about the needs of our people. So it's a reciprocal approach. And... Um, and trying to build that, that foundation of how are we going to move this forward to become reality. And it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's very exciting. There's a lot of opportunities that come with it. It's, uh, it's uh, a great opportunity for everyone, not only for our people. We're just about out of time, Margaret. Yes. If people want to find out more information, how can they do that or how can they get in touch? Well, we have our uh, Wateniganyap uh, website. It's www watepower.ca. We'll put that on the screen. Yes, and also we have a number of contacts uh, on, on the website, such as myself. My number is 807-737-2662, extension 2233. And we also have our communications officer, John Cutfeet. His number is 807-737-0935. Margaret, thank you so much for coming on the show. It sounds like a really exciting project, and I'd like to have you back once the construction starts and, uh, and give us an update. Definitely, I will do that. Thank you for inviting us and we hope that uh, people will get excited about this project as well. Great. Right. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, check us out on Facebook, we're Community Conversations. We're always looking for your feedback and suggestions. Stay safe until we see you next time.